Welcome to Learn Innovation Law. Here we have Orly LaBelle, who's a professor at University of San Diego School of Law and the author of Equality Machine, not to mention just a really awesome, interesting person all around as well. So I'm so thrilled to have you join us for hopefully the first of an interesting series looking at some law authors. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, of course. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Equality Machine. It takes a bit of an uncommonly optimistic approach to AI. So maybe you can tell us about the book and what inspired you to write it. Yeah. So the Equality Machine was really motivated by what I saw as a, an imbalanced conversation that we were having as a public and also in uh, policy reforms that were uh, bubbling around the world where there was what I saw as too much um, alarmist conversation and too much of a kind of a tunnel vision focus on all the harms and fails and risks and wrongs that technology and specifically the acceleration of artificial intelligence has been bringing to the world. And uh, what I just said about balanced conversation, that is the motivation behind the quality machine. It's not about saying, oh, let's shift from an alarmist, uh, dystopian, you know, narrative to a utopian, you know, just all good, uh, overly optimistic. No. And, you know, if you read the quality machine, you see that I very much recognize that there are uh, ways in which uh, technology fails us. Uh, there are uh, better and uh, worse ways to design, uh, you know, algorithmic decision might be and, and to uh, integrate automation into every aspect of our lives. But really what is, I was arguing and I still argue and I continue to research in this field is that, A, the train has left the station, you know, it is happening whether we like it or not. B, there is a lot of good that and a lot of potential. And so we should be optimistic and see related to this, um, if we are actually identifying the good ways to uh, integrate and to design and to deploy uh, AI, then we actually have what I call in the book skin in the game. And we are you know, much more likely to um, create the right regulations, to uh, invest in the, you know, in, the, in those better choices rather than, you know, when we take this stance of merely critiquing, I talk about how we're standing there from the outside and then just uh, it, perversely it becomes kind of this free flow of, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, technology is here and we're going to actually get the worst uh, case scenario. You see a lot of regulators nowadays who are as you said, focusing on the bad side of things and saying we've got to institute bans. Um, but you've also written in the equality machine about all of the potential good too, and especially in your area of focus where you write a lot about employment law and technology. Uh, what are some of the the good things that can come from using AI in a space like the employment space? And are there, you know, are there any uh, concerns on the other side that you still have? with using big data yeah. or AI in that space. Yeah, and again, I always have concerns, uh, you know, it's inevitable and some of them are still unknown because everything's happening so quickly and the technology's becoming very powerful. And so definitely an overarching um, concern that I have is with market concentration and with lack of transparency. So again, I actually want us to identify best practices. I want um, you know, public policy to have a role in shaping, you know, what are the gold standards of like a hiring app that uses algorithmic decision making. But as you say, especially in my field, although the book really takes us on this ride from um, employment to uh, health and uh, even intimate relations, uh, our, our family structures, our uh, consumer, you know, use of, of all kinds of uh, personal digital assistants. But when I start with uh, the workplace where I do a lot of work and as someone who's been teaching employment law and employment discrimination for a couple of decades, I, I'm very aware of how, you know, right now the status quo is far from perfect. And it's been 
quite frustrating, in fact, to see a lot of our quest for equality stagnating. Uh, so the gender and racial pay gap really stagnating. Um, our human biases being so difficult to shed. So, you know, uh, even when there is a, an employment discrimination lawsuit, it really doesn't transform the workplace in, in a meaningful way um, most of the time, I think. And then um, just so, so, so really kind of thinking about the potential of uh, overcoming some of our human biases and um, expanding the talent pool. Uh, it's actually, that's another thing that, as you know, Chris, uh, I my, my first two books very much concern talent mobility and um, the ability to exit uh, and to compete with your former employer. And with the Equality Machine, I set forth that this prism of saying, well, how do we know what jobs are available? What, uh, how do we match employees and employers better? How do we expand the search, uh, expand the ways that we identify talent? And again, I, I, I identify uh, hiring apps that really help employers do it. Um, because one more thing that I'll say is that I really believe, and this is this is maybe this may be my optimism bias. I really believe that. Most companies do want to do the right thing. They don't want to discriminate. They, they do want to find the best talent. They do want to be in compliance um, and to do well while, you know, doing good, uh, you know, being diverse. And, and um, for that kind of majority of companies, I think it's, it's important to have the, uh, the regulator help you know, sort out the snake oil of AI from you know, what really is effective. Yeah, you mentioned in the book that perhaps outright bans from regulators on assessing things like race or gender through these models uh, would be problematic because it also doesn't allow uh, companies who want to promote diversity to be able to do that effectively. Would you say that's kind of where you landed? Yeah, I think that's an accurate description. Of course, that raises the red flags currently with our um you know, current Supreme Court cases uh, that really reject being um, more um, race aware or, uh, you know, diversity aware and, and, you know, that problematic um, term of affirmative action, which the Supreme Court has told us we, we're not supposed to do. But what I argue is that with algorithmic decision making, that's, uh, it's not only that normatively, I think it's, it's important to actually seek diversity and, and to um, be in a lot of contexts aware of the fact that we need to be proactive about diversifying the workplace and accommodating uh, for different needs for you know gender and, and, and other demographics. But I also think it's becoming impossible to really blind uh, an algorithm because as I explained in the book, you know, really, even if you blind it, uh, for gender, race, ethnicity, religion, um, there are going to be so much, you know, data and information, the proxies that will, the, the algorithm will, will see things that we as humans don't. So yeah. I, what I argue is that we really need to shift the focus from trying to um, minimize the kind of information that we feed um, a system and look at the outputs and look at what mm -hmm. are we actually achieving. I think it's, it was always a good idea to actually look at, you know, what, what is actually happening and not have yeah. this kind of do not, but more of a proactive, uh, you know, yes, you know, make the, the workplace better. Um, but now it's also the reality. I really appreciated that your book comes from a female perspective because so many of the examples that you use are ones where I think it, it, it really is something that resonates a lot with with women that they've had these experiences of experiencing bias that they can't seem to they can't seem to get good documentation for and yet now that we have AI and big data systems, we can monitor for that. So one of the examples you mentioned in the book is the number of interruptions of female Supreme Court justices and how that's much higher than the number of interruptions that male Supreme Court justices get and that those female justices are less likely to be the 
uh, the interrupter. And after seeing that data, they actually were able to make some changes. So how do you think that um, having access to that kind of data can can help people make decisions just on improving the day-to-day experience of women and diverse groups in the workforce? And um, do you think that AI can maybe be useful at amplifying those uh, female and diverse voices to make sure that we actually get those perspectives considered and studied? Yeah, and so I love that you bring that uh, specific example up uh, because I really do think it's an example of something much uh, bigger, uh, not only of identifying patterns uh, of exclusion that we might not be noticing. And as I mentioned, you know, we're all really bad um, as somebody who does behavioral uh, studies and I collaborate with social psychologists and I look at human bias and irrationality. We just know that we're we're not good at understanding, you know, our own motivations, our um, own uh, processes and biases and, and these kind of minute things or or things that are not, you know, the clear discrimination, the smoking gun that we used to identify in the past. So so those patterns, um, it, I think it's I, I think of AI as like putting a mirror in front of us and helping understand the the root causes, the processes that are um, creating exclusions. I think that's a really powerful tool. But even, you know, kind of in the bigger picture is that, uh, and, and this is um, somewhat controversial, although I, I hope it's not too controversial and becoming less controversial, but it is part of my argument in, in my book, is that um, we, we tend to be... Um, Kind of very fearful of anything that seems like surveillance um, and an infringement or on our privacy, our you know intrusion upon seclusion, and and I do argue in my writing that we've been privileging this right of privacy, and in the book I say privacy is important, but it is one of many goals that we have, many rights um, that we uh, want to maintain. We've always had some tension between our quest for equality and safety and privacy and um, better health and well-being. And and we have to be very deliberate and open about how we, we've we never been able to get all of them at once at, you know, in, you know the high level. And, and, and thinking about opportunities to maybe mitigate those tensions through technology where there are, I think, are more creative ways these days to um, secure privacy, um, you know, uh, keep it um, or keep our our personal uh, information secure, but still see things that were hidden and still complete many data sets that have been very much skewed. So it, when, when I jump into the chapter on health, that's something that I open with, how the female body has been long neglected and kind of uh, really not studied. Uh, I, I talk about FDA um, clinical trials that have, for, for decades, really been designed for the male, the white male, you know, uh, physiology. And so, again, thinking about these opportunities of completing what we know or, or making what we were collecting and seeing and shedding light on, um, you know, more representative, more complete, is really, I think probably the best uh, use of AI. Yeah, you mention a lot in the book about how there's this this balance, as you note, about privacy, especially when it comes to something like medical access, right? And so you have these situations where, for example, AI can be really good at radiology. I think you've mentioned in some of your uh, your speeches on the topic as well. And yet there's, there's a lot of rules that might prevent the the tools from getting access to the amount of information that they need to be really good at doing the things that AI is good at, especially in the medical space, where it could be one of the greatest boons if we actually allow that data to be used. And on the other hand, even once you've trained the models, being able to use them to make medical decisions in the absence of access to a medical professional is often something that can be really difficult in a regulatory environment. And so how do you see it, this playing out? Let's say if we get a model that is 90% accurate one day at identifying uh, various things that you could identify from radiology, 
how would we how would we use that? Would we allow individuals to use that without the aid of a medical doctor if they couldn't easily access uh, a medical doctor? Would we allow any kind of self treatment using AI or using um, autonomous medical uh, technology? Yeah, I mean th- those are huge questions, and we will actually be at that point of at, at having to answer them uh, quite soon. Um, some of them actually already now. And and my uh, short answer is, yes, I would allow it if the alternative is not having access. Um, so so that's actually uh, probably the, the most important uh, argument that I'm making throughout the equality machine is thinking about the comparative advantage and um, you know the, the effectiveness compared to what? Compared to the status quo, compared to not having, and, and this is the reality of so many people around the world, you know, especially, I think it's hubris not to think about the developing world uh, and um, whether uh, women, for example, have access to an annual mammogram. And if they, d- if the answer is no, and then you have a tool that, as you just, you're describing, is 90% accurate, or even if it's 70% accurate, you know, it's better than not having anything. And then you can, you know, uh, I mean, it will be a very context specific answer of, you know, what can you do on your own in terms of diagnostics? Um, I, I've actually been uh, very honored and um, had the, the pleasure of the quality machine being selected by Stanford Medical School this year as the required reading for all uh, med students, all the incoming med students and the faculty. They, they select one book um, a year or two for, yeah. So, and, and I, I was there on, you know, um, at keynoting their kind of opening orientation week with um, Dean Lloyd Minor, who's the Dean of Stanford Medical School. And so we were talking a, lo- a lot about this. And I think that medicine is um, this prime example where there is, um, undoubtedly scarcity of resources. Um, the doctors are overwhelmed. There's a lot of uh, doctors who are leaving the profession because of burnout. Um, there are a lot of just huge disparities um, between you know the the richest who get very good patient care and those don't don't have um, access to health. So really thinking about it from a perspective of justice and and well-being for all and scaling um uh, and and cost is is something that is not only uh, i'm arguing allowed but it really should be our duty as a society to to you know to accelerate and to deploy the technology that helps alleviate those um exclusion that's a great perspective you know you mentioned that regulators are so concerned about the, the big downside, that they're not considering enough the absence of upside that could happen exactly. if they're over-regulating some industry or, or preventing it from being used for, for critical uh, underserved groups. Right. And in fact, there's like, you know, again, bringing back the kind of um, basic behavioral insights, there is a term for that. That's, that's status quo bias. It's like thinking about, you know, the, the costs or the harms of deploying something and not thinking about the costs and harms of, of not using technology when it's here. Uh, so, and, and we can, we, we just talked about like radiology or, or uh, applications for, for health, but we could have the same conversation where we're talking about autonomous vehicles, for example. Oh, 100%. Yeah, because you can think about the the many gains that we get um, from using autonomous vehicles and the improvement in amount of lives lost. And yet people say, well, there's a few lives lost. And so therefore, we shouldn't allow it, even though it's improving the yeah. amount of lives yeah. lost. It's a very difficult yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned yeah. burnout. And that's one area where I think it brings me back to this this idea that AI might be useful for, and big data might be useful for helping us to confirm things that are intuitions about the experience of some groups that that you just really have to prove it with data in order to get somebody to take action. You know, Dr. Burnout, for example, uh, anybody who's known people in the medical profession, they know that especially in the early stages of their careers, they get severely burned out, overworked, they underperform. And we have some data showing that level of underperformance. But I wonder with with more data, 
can we actually do things to change a lot of the status quo of how we work to say, look, we really do have data that people are going to work better if they have fewer hours. They're going to work better if they have more flexibility around their family life and how much that actually would impact uh, the bottom line to make it profitable to make those sort of human centered changes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I do think that's a, a really um, good and positive and, and desirable use of, uh, of, of uh, monitoring, of using big data. Uh, and, and of course, you're going to get resistance. So, so for example, now we um, are much more likely to uh, work remotely in, in every industry. And we know, again, from the data that um, women uh, might be disproportionately actually benefiting from it because they can manage their work lives uh, balance better. If they have a sick child, they can still be at home and work and, and the, you know, uh, be there for, for their kid. Um, so, so I actually think that companies are looking at this. I, I mentioned some of the kind of um, better players and in different industries that have learned some of these lessons using um, data mining and looking at like, um, why do women tend to leave, you know, a year after they, they've had their first baby and they, and they see it's, you know, because the commute and, and, you know, there are ways to, to make work more flexible. Um, but then of course we're getting a lot of the pushback on, wait, you're going to put this software that's going to look at my data strokes and like, you know, or my, my keyboard strokes and look at, you know, have a camera on me when I'm at my computer in my home office. I see, you know, I see the fear. Um, I just am calling in the equality machine for, you know, stopping and thinking about the trade-offs and not just accepting that story from, you know, some other bestsellers that just tell us it's all surveillance capitalism. It's all for evil. You know, that's not true. It's knowing more in general is something that we want for progress in arts and science, right? Like that's, yeah, that's you and I studying innovation. Um, interesting in progress we know that like that's how we learn um you know so so as a default knowing more is a good thing and uh, you ha would have to say more about you know when what are our real you know red lines um but another thing um that i talk about is um pay transparency and and um how um knowing more using software that's now available for uh, a lot of companies can shed light on you know how that pay gap widens over time and, and it also empowers um, employees and especially again, women um, who notoriously have not asked and have not, you know, uh, negotiated and uh, asked for what they're worth uh, as, you know, as, as frequently and, and they have, you know, all these penalties when they do ask. So again, having the numbers in front of you, both for on the employer side and definitely uh, for the employees, it's really powerful. Yeah, that's true, because sometimes what women try to express just by describing their own experience ends up making them look bad or be unliked. But if they can put that forward simply by looking at data or ideally do not have the responsibility to be putting that data forward for people and have that data be automatically uh, monitored, that's going to really improve their positions without causing them to have that likability drop that comes when they're self-advocating. Yeah, exactly. I talk about the digital paper trail. You know, there's all this, um, you know, fear that once we're digitizing everything where it's a black box, we don't know what's happening. But in fact, you know, uh, the fact that we have uh, records of like, what, what did that interaction look like? Uh, I think you and I both have had that experience of like, we can go back actually to the the emails and say like, look, we have it in writing. And that has not been the experience of women in generations before us where they, you know, experience yeah. hostile work environment, they're experienced uh, harassment, they're experienced, you know, inappropriate behavior or, or just misattribution, you know, taking away their credit and all these things that happen to women, you know, for generations. The fact that we have much more of the, you know, uh, again, digital paper trail, I think is a powerful thing. That's great. I think that's a great place to end our discussion of sort of the 
the really interesting book that you've written here. I really appreciated reading it. I wanted to talk more about your process and what you, you know, what do you do as an author when you're writing? You've also had some great experience recently of licensing one of your books, uh, You Don't Own Me, to a TV deal. And so I'm so curious about, about your process and, uh, and your experiences there. Okay. So, uh, Krista and I were joking before when I just got on. My process is obviously very messy. <laughs> I, I'm a messy writer and a messy, um, just, uh, you know, person in general. Like I, I don't. Beautiful uh, things come out of my messes. Home. I firmly believe I know. This is my home office, but like my, my uh, campus office is also uh, just, I joke with my students. They come in and things are like falling <laughs> over them. And I'm like, this is. <laughs> A badge of honor saying, you know, like I'm actually a productive, you know, uh, professor. Yeah. Like, you know, but um, I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, being busy and having three kids and having a partner who's very supportive and understands my work and is my uh, co-author frequently. He's a an academic himself. All of those have been wonderful because um my, my uncle always says if you want something to get done give it to a busy person um Very it good. actually has been yeah it's been pushing me always to um, be very efficient in the time i have i just uh from from a writing perspective i've really let go of this idea that i need like a full day writing block so that I get into my views and everything. No, when I'm writing um, toward a deadline, it's a 20 minute here and a half an hour here. And I just like those stolen moments in between, like going to my daughter's volleyball game and, uh, you know, teaching a class. And that's just, you know, what you can do and, and staying active. Or, yeah. Just, uh, I'm also just very passionate about, um, telling the stories that matter. Uh, so that keeps me motivated. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's so hard, I think, but as, as a fellow mom, I, I get that experience of somehow parenthood teaches you time management skills that you've never had to learn before. <laughs> uh, but as you said, you find those stolen moments. I, I still need to get better at doing that. Uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about, um, now, once you've got your book, let's say you, you have this sort of uh, this approach where you just kind of toss together your passions, it sounds like. But once you've got it together or maybe as you're getting it together, tell me more about about what you do or anything interesting you've discovered in the process of, of book writing or uh, your experience with licensing. OK, so, so you said once you get so one of the differences between writing an article and writing a book that I've learned now um, with. I, I have three broader audience books now, uh, and uh, it, it's with the writing of an article, you you publish it and you're off to the next thing. But um, for me, it's been very rewarding to uh, take a book that now comes out and really use it as a platform to uh, reach many um, kind of outside of my network. Um, Communities, uh, scholars, uh, policymakers. After after I'm talking to you today, I am talking with uh, the office of a uh, um, senator uh, in DC who is interested in AI policy, and they somehow picked up the book and they want to talk more. Um, with you asked about licensing with my previous books so, so my first book, Talent Wants to Be Free, was all about job mobility, which we talked about now. And if that has been very rewarding. Um, after the book came out, I became part of uh, President Obama's policy team on non-competes and more recently um, have helped the Federal Trade Commission with a new rule and uh, writing, you know, a lot of different things uh, related to that. So kind of really seeing the book get wings and, and actually, you know, get teeth in the next policy. Phase, yeah. Yeah, um, and and with and my next book, you don't own me, was a single story about Barbie versus Bratz about all this litigation and and the dark side of Barbie, as the si subtitle uh, suggests. You don't own me, how uh, Mattel versus MDA revealed Barbie's dark side. Um, 
And that book, uh, what came out before the Barbie movie. So, you know, it definitely was a few years before I was, uh, you know, excited about telling the story of the doll wars and how um, intellectual property and market forces and just dynamics, corporate culture shapes the, the culture that we have, the icons that we have. Um, and I think it's a great story. It has these like, strong personalities on both sides of the like Mattel and, and the uh, corporation that produced brats. And um, it has cool, like I tell the story of litigation. So it has a cool involvement of the uh, court uh, proceedings where it has like two jurors. I talked to jurors, I talked to um, judges and to the attorneys. And, and I was thinking about it already um, Kind of in terms of like what if it becomes a mini series or a or a movie and so i would end the interviews that i did every time i would say like if, if you if somebody would had to play you from hollywood who do you think you know would be a good actor to play you oh, that's great. um yeah and uh and and then it was really um exciting that cbs licensed it um what is less exciting is that they've been taking a really long time uh, and I've been learning more, you know, that it's not our world, uh, looking at production. And, and so there are these really talented script writers attached to the project, but with the entertainment industry, as you know, like they, it keeps changing, like CBS about Paramount plus and Paramount got the licensing and, and then they reverted back because there was the writing strike. So the writer's strike really delayed a lot of the uh, projects that were happening. And that was when the Barbie movie came out. And, and um, so it was unfortunate that it was a time range. So I, I don't have um, exact news for you. Like it's still uh, under option. One of the things that when that I've learned that when when uh, a book is under option, you know, it really does mean that you can't license it to anybody else. and in the meantime, I was getting uh, requests from other uh, production companies, and 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 they license like the both the rights for for uh, scripted you know, miniseries which they're developing, but also for any documentary. It's so it's been tricky um, to see. Uh, and the other hand, again, as you know, as an intellectual property scholar, when you write nonfiction. It's also tricky to control, like, you know. I'm so curious about that I, part. I, I, yeah, yeah, I had, right, because I had some, I had an experience, and I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm thinking that nothing came out of it, but it was scary for a while where um, this other production company tried to option it, and we went with CBS. Um, and then I heard that they would we're still wanting to develop it because you can always claim, oh, well, we did our research on our own too because it's, you know, it is a public, you know, it's a nonfiction case. So, you know, I don't, I don't have good answers for you and I can also it I'll sounds say very that complicated. <laughs> it's complicated it and exciting and rewarding. Yeah. So either way, you know, whatever happens, um, I feel great that, you know, I told a, a story with a lot of, um, you know, richness and yeah. And so, yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for and, the and next project. Out of, out of but, no. You mentioned that while, while that option was out, you, you received offers from others. I mean, is this yes. something where your agent kind of contacts, uh, you know, other people to say you might be interested in licensing it or do people just come to you? How does that work? Yeah. So, um, my liter. so the first, part was my literary agent found a, a Hollywood agent uh, that are their partners. And yes, the the um, Hollywood uh, agent, Brooke Ehrlich, uh, you know, very, very established. I think she just pitched it to a bunch of studios and um, CBS uh, got the deal. It was it was very cool. Like I, they got me, CBS actually paid for an attorney that would represent me independently because I was like, just license oh, wow, it, just great. make it, you know, I don't care. Yeah. I like, you know, I'll sign, just where can I sign? 
But she was very good at like, no, you know, we're going to get new executive producer rights and we're going to get great. new, like, you know, all of these things, which is cool. You know, I was learning about um, what what I should be demanding. And and um, on the other hand, um, the CBS, again, has been um, developing this for quite a while and I, I want it to accelerate. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, now it was independently, like just because the book has become, you know, on the radar of a lot of uh, uh, people and I uh, got great reviews and 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 the Barbie uh, movie came out, uh, there was a new renewed interest. So suddenly without us even trying, I just got direct emails of like, are you presented? <laughs> uh, you know, is this option? And, and I had to say, sorry, it, yeah. it's locked in. So now, again, like, I know I'm kind of saying this, I'm repeating this, but I just, you know, I just want it so to be much. made. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, I hope it, I hope it does. And I'm really excited to see thank it. You. I, so thank, thank you. So thank you again for coming on <laughs> today and talking with me. It's always it's so interesting to hear from you and all your interesting books. And I can't wait to follow the rest of the stuff that you're working on. Likewise, I'm excited. Krista is going to be speaking about her work soon uh, with me and, and, and my seminar. So thanks. Thank you.